Um, greetings. Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> greetings. What the hell is that? Like, welcome to Masterpiece Theater. S- salutations, everybody. Um... Shit, I didn't come up with a way to refer to myself in this episode. Um, so I'll just introduce myself as a Captain America simp. Uh, like like Agent Coulson. Yeah, I already he, feel douchey. <laughs> he, uh, he really wanted Captain America to sign his cards. He also designed his spangly blue spandex outfit. So I have to thank him, even though he died and then was revived for television purposes but uh who are you who who am i speaking with oh i'm uh, tyrell james uh, otherwise known as discourse stew um and, uh, and i'm actually nicole but you hopefully if you're listening at this point you've listened to our other episodes so you know this bird voice by now i mean th- this show like you know like uh like the marvel movies you've got to you've got to get all the lore you've got to start at the beginning and and work your way through if you want to know what's what's going on um phase 1 was your pet sitting arc yeah <laughs> and uh i don't think i've talked about it on the show cuz it's really not salient at all but <laughs> phase 2 was was the um was was the watching my nana's brains melt and dribble out of her ears arc that was that was a fun way to spend a month we can cut that. I don't know if anybody needs to. That, that's not fun. But but uh, this movie is kind of fun. I mean, I still had fun with this movie. But like like Captain America, the the last movie we did, which I the episode's not out right now, but I imagine I'm going to have so so much secondhand embarrassment listening to myself uh, soy out over Chris Evans. But I did did lower the star rating on this movie in my letterbox sticking it to the man but definitely con- considering what we have coming up this is this was fun i mean this, this was is fun i didn't hate watching this i still got quite a bit of enjoyment but um the big thing is i am so desensitized to cg spectacle that even the big epic moments that i remember being really big and huge when it came out 20 20- 12 i almost 10 years, years ago. ago but <laughs> 10 years ago like it it doesn't have the same impact it's 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 very like hollow um in that aspect upon rewatch but i don't how, what are your feelings you're a bit more it's, cynical uh, than i am i i am well, here's the thing i liked this movie when it came out i saw it in the theater um i was I've never been, I was never a fanboy, but I was like, you know, I thought some, you know, I thought Captain, like, I thought all those, I, I was a lot warmer to those movies then than I am now because of the con- different context and being less of a snob, being like 18, 19, 20. And, and I do think like, I'll just, I'll get the praise, you know, I, I come, we come here to bury Marvel, not praise it, but I, I'll, I'll get the praise part out of the way early just to be, cause you know, like this movie was huge. It launched like really, I think the MCU as we know, it starts here. Um, everything else is kind of prehistory yeah yeah i i'd agree it's especially because um although i i could make the argument that captain the previous movie we did which was captain america the first avenger is where thing kind of felt like they actually started to come together because we know the three previous movies were shit um but i i agree this is really when people think about the marvel movie this is probably the movie or at least many of the moments they're thinking about. Like it's, it's the pure version of the formula. Yeah. Like, and it's like, well, it's, it's like the establishing, like everything here on out will be aping this, this establishes the house style and everything else is an iteration on or reaction to it. Everything before is sort of like, like everything up to this movie is sort of like in Alien Resurrection when uh, uh, Sigourney Weaver finds all the failed clones of her. Speaking of which, written by Joss Whedon. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, didn't he write that screenplay? He did write that screenplay. Okay. Um, where where Ripley finds all of the failed clones of her and they're all deformed and messed up in some way. The ones laying in the bed kill me. The the, the in in the Marvel universe the one saying like kill me is probably the uh black widow movie oh that's after i'm saying avengers is like the, okay. the successful 
one, right? That's what it's I'm the like, successful okay, clone. Yeah. It's, um, this is, it, it, it's, it can live and breathe and tie its shoes on its own, yeah. I presume. And, and it's, it's a perfectly competent film. And it's impressive in that it takes all these characters that have all been set up in all these different movies and manages to round them up, tie them together. Each of them stands out. Each of them gets a moment. Each of them gets a little arc. I mean, it's not like amazing. Uh, it's not like everybody's like, it's not like everything's perfectly nailed, but it's like. It's no, a pretty this isn't big, a Mad Max Fury Road. No, no, but it's a people. pretty big ask. And that was like why everyone was excited for this movie in the first place. Like, you know, it it hadn't this kind of thing hadn't been really done in movies, especially big budget movies. And it worked. It basic it functions as a film. It does everything it needs to do. It's reasonably entertaining. Uh, the cast is. I mean, that, that's one thing they've consistently had basically is good casting. Oh which yeah, has been, oh, which has been holding this whole hold. franchise together the whole time. Um, yeah. And Give and the, the cast is all strong. Couple of exceptions, yeah, but by and large, <laughs> as we've discussed, yeah, um, and and it's and like I said, like like you, like I mean, Thor is bad, Hulk is bad, Iron Man two is bad, but Iron Man, Captain America, and and this in particular, you sit down to watch it, and you will be basically entertained. Yeah, um, yeah, you, and, it's a good pop. They're good popcorn movies. Yeah, and it's at least adequate, but it, it, it like it, the the combination of the unprecedented, like bringing all the characters together into one thing and actually doing it reasonably well uh, and being a, a competent adventure movie, uh, all those things combined are why it was a huge hit and why the Marvel franchise, the whole MCU thing didn't sputter out and die. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's really on this movie. Like, like I said, this is everything else is prehistory. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the clone attempts, whatever. This is really, this is really where our whole project starts. Is right here. Um, it's the make it or break it moment. Yeah, really. and, and we're going to. If see, this had failed, it would have been a big fucking failure. Yeah. And and giving credit where it's due is is necessary to understand why the MCU came to dominate film, and why everything tries to copy it. And and it's important to understand what does honestly work about this movie within the context of what it's trying to do. Um, in order to understand going forward how all these elements are going to be uh, uh, kind of algorithmically delineated uh, and 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 overproduced and run into the ground and 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 turned into gruel uh, as it goes yeah. on. Yeah. Um. So that's that's can the I? that that's that's the yeah. get, getting that out of the way. Now we can now we can uh, pick it apart. Um. um. Did you because I did you see this in the theater? You saw this in the theaters. I did when it came out. I, I saw okay. one of those. Rem, remember when they tried to bring back 3D movies? And oh God! Yeah, they I had those. I have glasses. They had those really shitty where they would take a movie shot normally and 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 retrofit it to 3D. Yeah, I saw yeah. it in fake retrofitted converted <laughs> 3D. Not because Ooh. I wanted to. But because it was the only ticket I could get, because the because I, I just I hadn't yeah. booked in advance or anything, so I just wandered downtown. I was in Vancouver, went to the the Scotia Bank Theater downtown, the big tall one, uh, on like Granville or Burrard or whatever it is, and no, not Granville. It was, I think it was Burrard, and 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 I, and, and there's just no other fucking tickets. And I was just like, well, I'm here. I'm not going back home. Uh, Fuck it! I'll take the stupid 3D conversion, one, even though I know <laughs> it's gonna, 3D. I know it's gonna look like shit and hurt my eyes. Um, and it did, probably. Oh, oh, oh totally. I'm guessing. Did. But like when my, my yeah. But I, I like this. Like then, like if we're in letterboxed terms, which is you know far and away the most astute way to evaluate film. Um, I would have made this. I would have called this like a four star movie when I first saw it. I enjoyed yeah. it a lot. Um, oh, I for a while this was like a four point five. For me, um, I so I did not see this in the theaters when it came out. I uh, I watched this on Mega Upload <laughs> the summer before I started college. God bless. Was it a, um, was was it like a camera hip? Was it like some guy in the no? It the was no. It was um this. I think by this point it was just about to come on to Blu-ray. Um, but I also remember there was a actual screening of the movie on my campus's quad, and uh, to promote that event because it was like a after everyone had moved into the campus it was just a cool campus event they had in our residential campus um so there were 
all these like photoshopped posters someone clearly just took like individual um vectored images of each of the avengers except for hawkeye there's there was no hawkeye in this in those pictures um and they also took just not not mark ruffalo bruce banner that is introduced in this movie but edward norton hulk uh bruce banner uh and they were they were just like up all over the place and i remember i took one of them because it had a Chris Evans, uh, Captain America in the spangly blue outfit. And by that point, my obsession was starting. So I, I held on to that maybe up until I think I moved out of my mom's house four years ago. Oh, yeah. This is this is the one you this is the one you ruined. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one I ruined. Um, can I give uh, we're, we're trying to do a little bit something different here. So I've decided to write. A synopsis, because this is a very, this movie has a lot of things going on, although I I think it connects them pretty decently. But just so we have a good place to start our conversation, um, theoretically, if people either don't care to watch The Avengers or haven't watched this movie in a long time, I'm going to give you some frame of reference. Don't watch it. You don't need to watch it. Just uh, we don't need to justify having no, synopsis. Just, just go just, for it. Just listen to what I'm going to say. So, from noted feminist filmmaker Joss Whedon, it's Marvel's The Avengers, the first big budget IP bukake of its kind to bring together different comic book characters from different comic book movies for the sheer purpose of making Disney a bajillion dollars at the box office. Loki, who's still really mad that he fell off the Rainbow Road in Thor, arrives on Earth and steals Captain America's glowing blue MacGuffin from S.H.I.E.L.D. so he can harness its unlimited energy to summon a CGI alien army to conquer humanity with. And since he's extra dramatic about it, he brainwashes both Stellan Skarsgård and accused spousal abuser Jeremy Renner from the Jeremy Renner official mobile app into joining him. Faced with a potentially world-ending scenario, S.H.I.E.L.D. director Samuel L. Jackson and the lady from How I Met Your Mother put the Avengers initiative into action to form a response team, recruiting quote-unquote reformed weapons dealer and Elon Muskin Robert Downey Jr., Loki's Chad brother Chris Hemsworth sporting natural-looking eyebrows, a recently unfrozen Chris Evans and a lot of tight blue spandex, Scarlett Johansson in a much better wig, and Edward Norton's replacement Mark Ruffalo as the big green rage monster we all know and love. Egos clash, Whedon speak flies, S.H.I.E.L.D. has a secret weapons development program, Agent Coulson gets shot because he's a Chris Evans simp like me, only to be revived off screen for television purposes. And it finally becomes permissible to destroy New York again in the climax of your movie, 10 years after 9 11 traumatized everyone. The Avengers, everybody! We, we sure do love destroying cities. Yeah. It, it really didn't take long for that end of history fatigue to. to 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 wear back in and for people to want to see uh, uh America blown to bits um so i just want to st- i mean so you talk about shield yeah they, they have this thing where they've got the the hydra the magic space magic powered hydra sci-fi weapons from uh captain america but they've also got nukes just on their heli carrier i never really thought about this when i first saw the movie they've got nukes on it shield yeah. is equipped with yeah. nuclear weapons. That's insane. What the fuck is that? Yeah. Actually, now that you I that didn't register until you just like brought it's, it up like because it's, it's that, not sh- that nuke that nuke uh the because the it's, what are they called the World Security Council which is sort of the Sele organization that shield Yeah, it's it's Powers Powers to? Booth and like three other people and like there's a Chinese guy and and a <laughs> yeah. and it's supposed to be um, like that like in XCOM when you meet all the world leaders and they set your budget based on how well you've defended them from aliens. Yeah, but there's they mentioned they there's like a a, a rogue plane that takes off um it, like, to yeah, it's New, an F-35. New York. And yeah, you, I didn't realize, or I didn't, I guess it just didn't register like where that nuke was acquired from. And I'm like, oh, wait, 
you're right. It was just already on that plane that took off off of the helicarrier, I guess. Yeah, they, it's not like yeah, launched so shield from a is U.S. Like, Navy submarine or anything. It's S.H.I.E.L.D. has nukes on their fucking Giant thing. helicarrier that's floating in the sky. How many fucking nukes do they have? And, and that thing, also that thing, the helicarrier almost crashed. It almost crashed. It almost fell out of the sky and blew everybody up. They put a Hulk on a thing that has nuclear bombs on it. Like, what? Brilliant. They took a guy no, prisoner on the thing that has theory. nuclear bombs on it. Like, I, and it's not that it's like, oh, it's a logical flaw, but it's just like the what S.H.I.E.L.D. is in the universe is so weird. Um, They're the world's greatest covert security network, according but, to the dialogue in this But it's movie. like the CIA, but they've also got an Air Force and a Navy. The CIA, they're also like NSA because they're, they're yeah. they explicitly say they're they're like they have the ability to tap into everyone's laptops and cell phones to get visual readings to figure out where fucking Tom Hiddleston ran off to with his stupid scepter. Yeah, it's just taken for granted they can do that. It's like a, two lines of dialogue and it's just thrown out there. Because it's convenient for the, that's the thing. Like this, the insane surveillance capacities the government has are just convenient for the plots of these movies. Um, like we're just jumping right in because like that that kind of floored me. And it also this is like a a, a a bit of a military hardware nerd nitpick thing, but it, like it's weird to me. So they have the the wealth and the technology and the means to build a flying aircraft carrier, and they've got these vertical takeoff and landing jet like transport ships. But then they also need to use Harrier jets, which are from the 60s and, and suck ass. They've always been crap. I don't care how cool it was in True Lies. And F-35s, which like which is that, it's just that, that Defense Department connection that all these movies that Hollywood has. Right. It's like, oh, yeah. it's our production value. We're filling our aircraft carrier with CGI jets. And I guess maybe yeah, real jets that are sitting on the green screen lot or whatever. It's like. You you have all of these sci- the shield has all this sci fi shit. They don't need real life military hardware. It's actually incongruous that it's sitting there. Um, I mean, and- it's it's purely in there just to like try to put some sort of realism into the idea of shield as this actual organization that is simultaneously the CIA, NSA. The and, and it's like, is it the part UN. of the is it part of the U.S. government or is it responsive responsive to this world security? I I I want to say I I want to say that might be elaborated on or given more clarification in a later oh movie. Uh, I Winter think Soldier maybe maybe. I yeah. mean, they probably didn't think that um, hard about it till they had to make that that movie. But it's like. I mean, and again, it, it's not like a cinema sins plot hole thing, but it, it's just like the why bother with the semi realistic stuff when you're also going to do this? Because 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 the, the the incongruity is weird. If if they just if if the whole helicarrier thing was just all sci fi shit, and if it just had no connection to the regular military at all, it would be less weird. But why why still persist with the 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 for lack of, it's not really not to call it, it's not realism, but the the real is the faux verisimilitude. Like I don't know what the point of it is. Yeah. Other than they get a other other than they get a bunch of money and resources from the Defense Department. Um. Um. I I will point out. Uh. The Pentagon did pull out, which is a lot to say. The Pentagon pulled out. Uh. Which is one of the very few things the Pentagon pulls out of. No, they they know. like to go. The in opportunity law. was there to make the joke, and I took it. <laughs> Swish, um, but yeah, I think the the Pentagon pulled out of uh, being involved in this movie, or like giving some sort of approval because they specifically had an issue with like the unrealism of this movie. <laughs> like they thought the the thought like an alien invasion was stupid, and they were like, "We're not sponsoring this shit." Which is weird because um, they had that whole thing with the Independence Day sequel, where it was like you went to the website for the movie and could sign up to join the Air Force. Which is a stupider movie. <laughs> that uh, movie is so stupid. I haven't but seen like, it, but so I assume stupid, it's, it's like charming. Equally stupid to the original Independence. Well, that's the thing. This the end. Like so much of the ending of this movie is just Independence Day. Yeah, blue, big, just, big blue gleam of light, of sky, and Randy Luke. Quaid flies up into it to heroically sacrifice himself to blow up the alien fucking ship. It, except Randy Quaid is Robert Downey Jr. 
Robert Downey Jr. survives, and apparently Robert Downey Jr. was paid $50 million for this movie while everyone else was given like two to five million. So I think that's like just around like 20% of the budget of like this this movie was made for twenty two hundred and twenty million dollars. So a quarter like, of the budget. Almost twenty percent of the budget just went to Robert Downey Jr. You could you could make a Robocop for the for cheaper than than the money for okay like like I think you we make two about Robocops. This. Almost, yeah. For the money they spent on Robert Downey. Maybe more. And like in, in part I get it because like he is a big part of the reason people are showing up. But also like you could make whole ass movies for that money. Like this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um and and it must be so much of the inflation because I always talk about it's like this movie costs 200 million dollars. It doesn't look like it costs 200 million dollars. It looks 220. 220. It, it looks like it cost <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's easy I'm rounding down. Um Hollywood accounting. Um it, it's uh it, it again it, it looks like a, a high budget episode of TV. I mean, I mean it's just a lot of CGI, yeah. so they probably wouldn't really have that in TV, which I think why people like TV better now. Um but it's like it you know, again, everything's very evenly lit, clean and smooth. Like it's not as awful as some of the later ones would be with it, but it's like, yeah, there's a lot of like cat like 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 like, like Captain America goes to just do like a little jump flip thing a little bit acrobatics to get from one floor to another you could have a stunt guy do that but he turns into a computer for three seconds like well some some of them like there's there's one jump he takes and it's it's clearly like a cg double and I, well I, I don't know actually now because i i did just mention mad max fury road and that is famous for having practically like no cg effects like they they just literally rigged a guy to a bungee cord and gave him a flaming guitar and they're like, here, yeah, go, yeah, go, they, do they it. Didn't really do um, much so, with CG that yeah, they in, if they could do it elsewise, which is why it's awesome. They they also probably just didn't want to. I don't know because they they could probably have gotten like a stunt double, but I I imagine Chris Evans also didn't want to like injure his beautiful, gorgeous face. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. The especially the opening scene, um, like the opening heist where Loki steals the Tesseract from Shield, who are uh, set up at NASA. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah, that that was very TV the, to me. In the well, yeah, yeah, that was NASA. They're, yeah, they're, I saw that, I, which was so they're weird. They're NASA. To me. Um, but yeah, like the but like guys, in Florida. That's where we start to see like the sets all look like TV sets, or they're not quite. They're a little too like clean, brightly lit, and uh, kind of small and synthetic looking. And a lot of yeah, bare rooms and command centers full of computer consoles. Um, J- Josh, as a director, Joss Whedon is like perfectly adequate and lacking with. Well, he's he's an ideal fit as a director for Marvel because he doesn't oh, for, really have any this, style. And he's, he's just adequate, um, ad- adequately competent. I think he tries to compensate for his lack of style with all the like swoopy shots and the panning takes, but it's just like it, it, they always seem like there's there's one in Serenity, the Firefly movie that capped off the series, and it starts with this like long, uh, like one of those five minute long tracking shots, and it's it's fine, but it get like it's like it feels like uh, yeah, you're you're compensating for not really being a a visual guy, I think. Although that's it's. Uh, because I've I've proposed that after after we finish discussing this movie that we sort of uh, dovetail into looking at some of the earlier DCU movie was which I know I am going to regret I I know I am going to regret that but I think at at some point we're probably going to have to do like a episode on them but like I'm I'm thinking if this movie had had more like filmmaking like stylistic flair to it i think it could have ended up being too like too noxious like the the same way the first suicide squad movie was just literally nothing but that where it's like we don't we don't have a first 45 minutes we're just gonna cut together all this shit like it's a video yeah. like a video game or well, a music they, they hired they hired a cup they the, after like three other edits with suicide squad they hired yeah. a company that did trailers the the trailer that specifically used queen because people watched that trailer and they were like holy shit this 
movie might actually be good. And it wasn't. It wasn't people. Well, I saw yeah, that well, shit in theaters and it's not. Okay, so we'll get to that. We'll get to the yeah. also rans and copycats and, and competitors. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the modern blockbuster as it becomes marvelified. Um, or as it tries to to kind of create an alternative to it. Um, but um, event. So, OK, so winding back to the Avengers. Um I kind of jumped right into the the shield stuff because 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 that was sort of insane, which which drives me. Another thing the shield has in common with the CIA is, um, I think I said this on the Captain America episode, is that they are uh, inheriting the legacy of Nazi technology yeah. and techniques and institutions to be a a worldwide uh, Gestapo. Which I will say, in I'm sorry, in defense of Captain America. Like, initially, he's like, you know, we, we've been given orders. We, you know, got to follow them. And as soon as he gets sort of that inkling that S.H.I.E.L.D. might be up to some shady business, and he goes looking in, like, the back halls, and he finds, like, hydro weapons, that's when he's like, okay, I don't fuck Which are just, no again, army. laying around on the helicarrier. Like, there's a lot of those little things. Yeah, they weren't, that are, they weren't that don't locked really... up very well. No, like, but why are they even <laughs> there? Like, this is, like, an active bit of thing why i i I think i so i mean we we know that like the um the uh strategic uh defense whatever uh that created captain america they later became shield so theoretically shield would have been the one to like have taken any um any of those hydro weapons that were uh, taken, but like captured, I guess, which is like, they, sh- they should have just destroyed that shit. But they also, like, it's, it's implied that later, uh, oh no, it's shown later. Um, it's shown later that uh, in Captain America that uh, Howard Stark finds the Tesseract while he's trying to look for Steve Rogers. Yeah. S- so presumably Shield has had the Tesseract for a while. Um and remember I had to point out the Tesseract did not first appear in Thor. That was a completely different yes. blue cube. Yeah, which um, which is ins- it's insane to me that they're just like we'll just yeah. have two blue plot cubes. Uh Oh, it's, it's another reason why F- Thor sucks. It's just clearly it's just one of those movies they were just clearly treading water and just like we got we got to introduce thor we don't know what to do just here's thor i had no idea what to do with him yeah uh let's how about let's let's talk about our characters or because the i i think uh, another like what i will give this movie props for is not feeling so overstuffed with characters even though like this is a pretty big ensemble cast like everyone has something to do. Even Hawkeye has shit to do. Um, Black Widow gets a much better introduction. Um, although you pointed out, uh, we exchanged notes before we started recording uh, just to see sort of where our thoughts uh, spiraled together. But you you pointed out that Black Widow's introduction in this movie also feels very uh, Joss whedon it's a thing if you go back through his stuff. And I mean, I was this. This is where I have to make my awful confession. I was a fan. Like I loved Buffy. I loved Firefly. Boo! Um, no, it's okay. You know, I, 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 I thought he was great when I was like nineteen. Um, and but you know, going back, you, you, you see this kind of theme where he's got like um, this kind of. And I mean, like I'm not against beating up your heroes actually i'm very in favor of beating up your heroes that's why that's what something i think sam raimi is good at is beating the shit out of his heroes like but there's there is a thing and, and I, don't, I don't even mean to say it and i mean like this is one of those things that like it, it would be an incidental observation not like a moral outrage thing but it's like it dovetails with what we found out about the guy after he got his kind of me too moment yeah. um, that's the uh elephant in the room um for i guess for people who do not no, or either do not care. Oh yeah, I guess or I'm taking, living under taking a rock. it for granted. Everybody knows, but maybe or, not. Or taking it for granted. Uh, yeah, Joss Whedon is not actually a feminist filmmaker. He's actually a pretty big asshole. Um, yeah, he's whole, he's a creep. Like a couple a- years ago, basically the entire cast of Buffy 
came out and said like he he was an asshole and like they they had to keep him separate from certain uh female cast members uh he uh, uh, but i think a lot of this came out after um the justice league movie because he 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 famously took over for Zack snyder um in post-production because there was a family crisis uh with Zack snyder so he didn't come back for post-production joss whedon did Huge reshoots. Uh, most of the reshoots. Re, yeah. And yeah, apparently he was like, according to Gal Gadot, he was like threatening her career, which is like, yeah, Gal Gadot, but, that's not the worst thing you that could ever happen to you. I don't, I don't think. No, uh, but he's, yeah, he's just a massive, he's, he's uh, 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 a bit of a, a creep prick. and a massive pr- prick. Just a huge, there is a New Yorker or whatever. There's New Yorker. Oh yeah, the, interview that with him, story. Which I, which I like found, a co- like a month ago. Yeah, which I found kind of fascinating because it like gave such a picture of like what kind of guy he is. And I'm like, I, I've never been. It took me a long time to even begin to develop like a sense of like astutely evaluating. I always tend to get. I tend to give people a lot of the benefit of the doubt. So I'm like, I'd like listen to Firefly commentaries and stuff, and just kind of like not pick up. It, but I think about some of the stuff I me- barely remember him saying in those. It's like, yeah, he's just kind of a pretentious upper middle class asshole um yeah it's uh um, we talked about the ar- how- <laughs> so the article the article we're referring to is uh it's uh in the in new york magazine it's the undoing of joss whedon and i i love the headline for it it's a uh, the buffy creator once an icon of hollywood feminism which is a term i have issues with as a feminist myself but, i think we can, hollywood uh, feminism creator, i think you can uh, uh, he's he's now an outcast accused of misogyny. How did he get here? So I, I'm Joss Whedon. This is you might think this is a crazy thing going on. Let me tell you how I got here. <laughs> Stupid. It's um, um, but it's fascinating as like a insight into that type of guy because they talked about how he grew up and his parents were just like people who'd ho- host hoity-toity parties where they read Shakespeare who just like turn on a dime and cut people down who didn't just consistently amuse them or impress them or have social capital. Like, which sounds like him. Ex- well, exactly. That's why like, that's what I yeah. thought was kind of interesting. Cause he's just, he's like a, a family of writers going back like three generations, TV writers. Um, but I thought, cause well, anyway, to digress. So there's this thing you see, you see it in Buffy, you see it in some of his other stuff. You see it in a big time in that show dollhouse, which I watched all of in like, barely remember just went right through me um and it's like we're gonna like treat a woman very sadistically either physically and or emotionally and then have her kick someone's ass and that's just like you just do that cycle like that's kind of like yeah. and i mean like i think there's probably i haven't gone back and rewatched it in years but i think there's probably still a lot of good stuff in buffy but that is well, like a thing of it and and again like i'm not against beating yeah. up your heroes emotionally or physically but it's like it's such a thing with him. It's like beat the shit out of this woman. Oh, and then she kicks someone's ass. But you start to wonder. Yeah. You start to wonder if there's not something to it beyond narrative tension or whatever. I mean, I, 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 I don't like. Obviously, he didn't invent that sort of no. like cycle itself. Like that is a that that sort of um, that that sort of thing is like the very basis of like the rape revenge genre. Yeah. Um, but I I don't know. I especially compared to Iron Man 2, I think uh Scarlett Johansson gets just a much better oh, oh, overall, shape yeah. of it in this movie. But I just I noticed like her her wig looks great. Um, you know, she she gets to do shit. Um and I actually this we had joked that about the whole terrible uh, Black Widow and Hulk matchup in the next Avengers, but there is kind of some sort of base. This movie does lay a little bit of a base. It's not a it. bad idea. So it, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's just Avengers Two bit. is a really shady movie. <laughs> because yeah, because uh, Black Widow is the one who is sent to go uh, get Bruce Banner, who is now a Mark Ruffalo who. God, he's he's great. I love Mark Ruffalo. He already well. I just I should clarify. Looks better, much more fitting. I I like him. I like him a lot. In this I just want to say, Black Widow's introduction. She's being like tortured by guys. It's like it's like a, oh, I was actually in control of the situation the whole time thing. But 
Like it's like she's being tortured by the guys and then she beats them all up. And that was just like, oh, it, it kind of something clicked there. But here, here's the oh, thing. Speaking she, of and she spoke Russian, right? Yeah, she she has that. They didn't omit anything about her being Russian. She has that line. She says, I, 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 no. I, I, I don't weep for the falls of regimes. I'm Russian or I used to be or something like that. Yeah. Or or no, she says, I'm Russian or I was. Was, which, yeah. Uh, I they had, had that the thought occurred to me because uh, neither of us have a have a Disney plus account. But I, I wouldn't pe- put a pass like Disney to go in and like edit the Avengers on the streaming service and like get rid of any reference to Natasha being Russian. I, I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if they did. It really would. But um, they didn't. Uh, I, I don't have Disney plus myself, but I do piggyback on um, my sisters. <laughs> yeah. So um, no one else. I'm, I'm just piggybacking off of like Netflix and HBO max for my dad. I'm not, I'm I'm totally fine with my Criterion and my movie subscriptions. I don't need Disney Plus. Fuck that. Uh, it's convenient. I don't really need it. I couldn't. Yeah, just it's, it's movies. convenience for convenience um, sake. But I, yeah, I really do think Mark Ruffalo is kind. I don't want to say perfect, but he he he. As we said in our Hulk episode, he's much more affable. And I buy him more as like the dorky scientist. Oh, totally. Yeah. He's, than I do Edward Norton. Yeah, he, like th- they give they give Mark Ruffalo glasses, and that does so much for the Bruce Banner character visually. It it really. But I found it with him. It's like I bought the idea, um, and I think he's maybe bringing more to the character than is even written. But I, I bought him as like a guy who's like warm and affable and really good natured, but also like has this anger, just kind of. Yeah, swimming under the surface. You can, you can kind of see Pika. He does a he's a good actor. He does a really good job in this. Um, yeah, better than yeah, honestly, I, like I think Mark the movie deserves. And it's kind of like I said, it's kind of a pity they could never really figure out what to do with Hulk because that's like the most interesting character they have. Um, in a in a parallel universe where it Marvel isn't wasn't what it is and didn't become what it becomes, you I think you could do a really interesting. Hulk. I, I talk about that. I, I talk yeah. about the, the, the episode we did. I just, I just think that's the most interesting one they've got. But um, what's the thing with her? And I noticed. I thought this was weird. Where she's like really scared of the Hulk, which is like, f- like I'm fine with the Hulk being scary. That makes a lot of sense. But mm-hmm. it's like just her. She is Black Widow's like uniquely terrified of the Hulk in a way nobody else can, is. Can you give me an example of like how she's more uniquely terrified well, than like anyone else? When, when I'm, she's I'm not, when she's sent I, to go, I, nothing's coming to mind. When she's sent to go deal with them, there's like it's like she's really tense. She's really uneasy. Oh, she yeah, she pulls out the gun. She pulls on the him. gun on him, and she's like really not like the, the her like totally. At, which again, like yeah. if, it's fine if everybody else is that scared of the Hulk, but when it's just her, it's a little weird to me. And then again, when he starts turning into the Hulk, she's like really freaked out and like kind of like frozen in panic when until she gets her head back together when they tell her to go do yeah. that. It's like she's like uniquely terrified of the Hulk in a way nobody else in the movie ever is set up to be. Okay, um, if I were to guess and this is I, I'm I'm sorry people, I'm I'm going to plug into my nerd brain for a second. If I were to guess, it might be because like so Black Widow is like an active agent of Shield. And we've we already know that like Shield was tracking down Hulk or based on the Incredible Hulk, so they, theoretically Shield would know just how dangerous Hulk is. So I I don't know, maybe she was just like debriefed on something. Well, like, I, it, I don't mean yeah, I don't mean from a plot it, perspective, yeah. like like. The, the Hulk should be scary. The idea that everybody's kind of on edge. Oh, but like around why him, specifically? But her? why her? Why is she set up to be the one that yeah. expresses this fear in a way nobody else does? Um, and I found that. Uh, because she can't have children. Yeah. Oh, boy, we'll get to that. <laughs> like- <laughs> but just, I found it really, I found it to be a weird, weird choice um, that I didn't really get. And I, like, I could see they're aiming for like a beauty and the beast thing with him, which is not a terrible idea. But again, she's just, and she's like, almost paralyzed with fear at, at that one point. Like yeah. she's like in the cargo bay, almost rocking back and forth until Nick three gets on the radio and gives her another thing she needs to do. And it's like, like I get that the Hulk is scary, but this is supposed to be one of the Avengers, a total badass. Why is she the only one like fucking on the verge of tears? Uh, 
dealing with this 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 big green fucking galoot. I I thought it was a I, weird. I, 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 I yeah. think it maybe suggests some of that weird like Whedon's whole weird thing where he's like. I don't know. His his psychosexual dynamics are really bizarre if you actually start to well, think about we, them because it's like I I'm we're pegging him for a foot guy. Oh, another oh, totally. another thing oh, we we yeah. clearly had the same we were clearly on the same wa- la- brain wavelength because we we noticed that in every scene she's in Gwyneth Paltrow is not wearing shoes. I didn't notice that, but he's totally a foot guy cuz I noticed other shots and um fucking there's other things like in Again, I talked about Serenity, the, the the concluding Firefly movie. There is a long shot of Summer Glau's little feet in that. Um, yeah, f- c- confirmed foot guy, absolutely. Com- confirmed foot guy uh, and and terrible feminist Joss Whedon. Yeah, um, he, he loves I, powerful women, but yeah. he also loves to subjugate and beat them up because he resents them, but is also in awe of them because he is a nerd who, who, who had no confidence, who didn't get any pussy until he was like 25. So Loki? No, Loki's like super fucking gay. No, Joss Whedon. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm joking. Joss oh. Whedon is, is like Loki, except Loki is really fucking I, I gay. Think he, I think he maybe also has a thing with the, I mean, I, this is way me just pulling shit out of my ass, but he, like the thing with the Hulk, like, oh, I'm like, I'm always angry, he says at the end of the movie. Like, I think maybe yeah. that he also kind of that's he's like, that's my secret. Code. Not, not that we know he's such a like prick who flips out at people He that maybe he's just like, you know, I'm, I'm this nice, smart, nerd, lovable nerd guy, but I've got this anger in me that keeps coming out and destroying everything I love. Anger and a need to fuck young actresses on the sets of my shows. <laughs> They're just throwing themselves at me. I can't. I can't help it. Um, um, speaking of middle aged creeps, uh, Tony Stark. Uh, the the big thing that this movie sets up is Tony Stark is no longer a weapons developer. Or at least he's he's completely shifted Stark Industries' focus to renewable, like clean energy. He he quit. He quit making weapons in Iron Man One. After in the at the end of the first act, yeah, but, but I, there's no mention of like him ceasing weapons development. I don't think or like no, no, that, he does. Okay, he I'm just, gonna focus on this instead, and like Iron Man two, except for the fact that he has to replace his he, arc he, reactor. He takes with, Stark Industries out of weapons altogether in Iron Man. That's why okay, uh, Jeff Bridges is so pissed at him. But they never really talk about. Oh, then what does Stark Industries do? They, that's never well, now addressed it's until renewable now. energy. But there's no because here's the thing: there is no money in renewable in in this kind of renewable energy. There's no money in it. If you can really make an arc reactor work, yeah, yeah, sell it, you set it up, it runs and produces energy, and you get no more money. That's like it doesn't. Yeah. Capitalism can't produce that kind of energy revolution because there's no money in it because it would functionally decommodify energy. Yeah, um, but it's it's it's. It's I I did also notice there is sort of a somewhat consistent or or at least recurring theme about energy in these movies or at least yeah, the, the phase one early phase two Marvel movies um like we we discussed it in Iron Man two about how uh Howard was trying to develop an arc reactor because he wanted to give people world peace and not make a billion fucking dollars off of it which is stupid but yeah nick in this movie nick fury i didn't write down the line but at some point he he explicitly says that the world needs an endless supply of energy if it's you well, know that's the, that's why the humanities to go on he says they're researching the tesseract which is god that's a stupid name uh they're researching that it's it's the power stone it's the blue it's the blue fucking Yo, fuck it We're, the stone blue cube. on the they're researching it's the blue cube blue blue stone on the affinity they're, gaul- they're researching people. the blue cube because he says it would produce unlimited renewable energy, but then it also turns out they're using it's it for weapons cube, research. Power cube. The space okay. cube, the blue space <laughs> cube. <laughs> it's, this, it's a stupid blue thing, people. It's just magic. No, but magic is also science. You see, and science is magic also is magic. also science, as we learned in Thor. Um, uh, Thor, uh, Chris Hemsworth looks much better in this movie than he did. In, in his actual establishing movie. Uh, as I mentioned, they did not bleach his eyebrows. Thank God. 
they he, and he doesn't show up until like 45 minutes into the movie. Yeah. Either he shows up pretty late. Well, I mean, what else is he? I mean, he's got no reason to even be on Earth until Loki well, his, makes himself his whole, known. So, well, this is this is why I think I I give credit to this movie for being able to give everyone something to do or have some sort of motivation because we've we've already discussed how Thor has like no character. They don't know what to do with him in that first movie, really. Um, here, just by. By default, because Loki is the main antagonist, Thor has stakes in the game because that is his brother. Um, but it's also like they made a big fucking deal about how he smashed the rainbow bridge in the first Thor. And he's just able to appear in this. Hold on. I wrote it down. He's able to appear suddenly on Earth in this movie because uh, all father summoned dark energy. Yeah, which which I guess is it's just the line, just the line. Basically, he can come to Earth without the Rainbow Bridge. It's just expensive, in some abstract, I guess. hand wavy plot thing. Okay, all right. It's like, oh no, we we got other ways Fine. to send you there. It's just like, it's like flying instead of driving. It's like, yeah, it's it's just expensive. We can't do it all the time. It's a family emergency. So we'll you'll, it's an Uber it's a family XL. it's a family emergency. We'll use the air miles. We'll get Thor to Earth, even if the Rainbow Bridge is out. Um, it's that. That's, that's all it is. I guess. You're, you're, it's the, I, I, Odin, I need to go to Earth. My brother is being a, a gay war criminal. Like <laughs> that's I, I, that's what I imagined. The how the conversation went, and then Odin was like, "I got to go to Odin's sleep." Yeah, no, Again. he's just he's just he's he's going into well, he's he's got the point. Where he's falling into Odin's sleep in his chair in front of NCIS. You know, it's like it's fifteen minutes to an episode. <laughs> He's <laughs> just like an old person. Um, uh, Chris Evans, though. Yeah, I, here we go. <laughs> okay, I, I, I. This is the movie that did make me fall in love with Chris Evans because uh, I. A lot of people, a lot of fans of this movie, actually hate this iteration of the Captain America outfit. It's kind of my favorite one because it is not just because it is like tight blue spandex. Um, but because it is, it is, it has that campiness to it. Like it is, it is literally like there's that that line that we can discuss because I, I read your notes and that was a very trenchant observation you made. But it it's a very it it feels very retro and very like colorful. Like and I think what really works about these Marvel movies, especially when compared to the the dour, depressing obnoxious uh early dcu movies is they they have a better balance at like the sort of campy kitschy elements of comic books and superheroes they're alongside some of the realism and and i i like that they i like that phil colson is such a fucking captain america simp he's like i made this outfit with my blood sweat and tears it's going to hug your gorgeous arm muscles and your impeccable ass and you know what steve just puts it on he does god bless him even though he's like uh I, and another thing because they're i guess the original cut of this movie was like three hours long and a lot of what whedon ended up cutting was stuff that was specifically following steve rogers as he's trying to adjust to being in the 21st century like there's i remember there's a scene um, where he goes to a cafe and that waitress uh, who he rescues at the uh, climax of the movie during the New York invasion, she she is serving him like coffee or whatever. And she's like, oh, do you need the wireless password? He's like, radio? So like his his whole, uh, they, they, they show enough of it in this movie, but more so in like what was cut. There was a lot of focus on him being like it's, quote unquote, it's the man too, out of time. It's which too is a, bad that just doesn't get its own movie. Well, I mean, you know, I won't say it's too bad because there shouldn't be any more Marvel movies. But again, in that parallel universe where they made like a where it, it, you know, in, in that parallel better world, the the man out of time thing could be its own, uh, its whole own deal. But that's the problem yeah. with everything. As, as everything becomes a crossover with everything else, everything is always setting up something else and and everything is just trying to keep you hooked for the next thing. You, you, you start running out of space to actually tell a story 
in the moment. <laughs> it's, yeah. It becomes all tail, no cat. Um, I mean, if 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 it were up to me, all Marvel movies would just be about Steve Rogers and Chris Evans. Although Chris Chris Evans was right to be like, I'm done. They'd all be a coffee shop AU where Captain America no. goes up to 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 one of the birthplaces of the American Republic, and and he meets a nice the founding a, fathers, and he meets a nice young woman who who is who is an arts critic. And a and a cynical fucking communist. Uh, uh, and she converts him to I, communism, and he puts and an hammer and sickle on his shield, and 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 he shows her it's it's okay to love again, and they heal each other's yeah. psychic wounds. Um, sort of. Let's let's go because that that old fashioned line of yes. dialogue. Yes, you. Yes, because that I think that is. A, Big boon to our discussion here. So, yeah, here. I, if you want to launch into it, this is kind of my my central thesis for this film and, and kind of the whole MCU. It's it's what clicked when I was watching it. Like, yeah, Coulson is like uh, 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 the Captain, Captain America America's, says, is, is yeah. it the Stars and Stripes? Is this a little old fashioned? And Coulson's like, well, I think we need a little old fashioned right now. And then I was going to think, so what is the old fashioned? The old fashioned is the idea of superheroes itself. Superheroes were a cheesy kids thing that went out of style and then came back. Um, yeah. American exceptionalism, like yeah, Captain America is like the idealized American, like the best version of America, but it's still like the idea of America being special and important as an embodied thing that it represents that America represents a belief system and isn't just a arbitrary unit of geography and, and territorial administration. Um, and it got me thinking, so like what, like, like, because we, we've been trying to de- like talk about like the ideology, of these movies uh promulgate or or passively incidentally reflect or or what have you and it got me thinking to the extent to which this movie is trying to have this and you see this with these movies uh, fairly often and, and and you see this argument being made by fans of comic books and and superhero stuff going back um years and years it's like this is modern mythology and 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 this is like the greeks had hercules and zeus and we've got captain america and and thor and well, the Nordics had Thor, but let's, let's believe that. Yeah. Um, you got Captain America and the Hulk and, and Iron Man, and and we need these characters as like the, to serve that critical function for like moral instruction and and motivation and morale and to bring us together. Uh, it's it's politically and socially and, and culturally important that we have these figures around and and tell these stories. And I, I realized, like, I think we. Like I might have been putting the cart before the horse with the ideology thing. Like the ideology exists to justify the intellectual property and why you need to buy it. They're trying to tell you these characters are important. Their stories are important. The products are important. You have to consume them because it's culturally and socially important to consume them. Yeah. And I think that like Hollywood and the culture is just kind of building itself importance. Like you go back to like, oh, you know, they they put this um You'd watch these things when I was a kid. It's like, oh, they they put a, a gay guy on the sitcom in the seventies, and it was so important. It was so important. It changed everything. It's like, I mean, it's great to put a gay guy on the sitcom in the seventies. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, I think the whole thing to to justify all the resources the culture industry consumes and all the money you spend on it and all the money the people in it get for producing it and and all that and so on. It, it it has to, and to justify the energy and time all the people put into it, the horrible working hours, uh, even for the actors, much less like the people building the sets and stuff. It's like to to justify all that, to to justify the love we have for it, the emotional investment we we we, we imbue it, and it it insists on imbuing itself and convincing us to imbue it with this social, cultural, political importance that I don't think it really has. But I think that's what the real ideology at work here is is. The ideology is a vehicle for the intellectual property to justify its importance to us, the yeah. audience. Yeah. On on this rewatch, like especially during the climax, um, I I'd already mentioned I've become pretty desensitized to just. Oh yeah, your eyes spectacle. just slide off of it when it's just, all computer. Yeah, shit. your eyes just slide off. But the the climax, especially, there's that one. It's it's like a it's like a sewn together fake one shot yeah it's following sort of at what everyone is sort of doing and i consciously thought like this this whole shot just feels like a like a selling reel for these characters yeah. like just 
show this, show this to people. And there are also just so many lines of dialogue that are clearly just like, you know, and everyone stood up and cheered moments. Like I could, I could visualize when, uh, it's like, like you can see it Captain in America the screenplay, goes, goes audience smash. applause. Yeah, when Captain America goes, like, tells Hulk to smash, that's when, you know, you, you can see all the uh, disgusting uh, 40-year-old fanboys sweating and standing up in their chairs. Ke- Kevin Smith leaps out, of his, leaps out of his seat in his giant uh, New Jersey Devils uh, jersey. <laughs> And and his and tears are streaming down his face, and he's throwing his, his hands up in the We're air. We're talking about Kevin Smith, <laughs> and he's and and he's, and, he, Kevin and, Smith. he's and he's just got the the first erection he's had in three years. Um. Also, also, just like especially during that climax, there are a lot of there's a lot of um use of like slow motion too for certain shots that are really just selling these particular parts is epic like it it also just feels like and i said in my letterbox review this is like a 20 220 million dollar saturday morning cartoon that climax especially parts of it feel like um and and sort of in in the most competent way possible like a bunch of kids playing with action figures. Well, that's like the you know, then then and then Hulk smashes into the building. And I, well, yeah. this is well, you're totally right. Everything feels like the movie's trying to like stop and fawning. You, know, you get those long, those those like severe uh, uh, up angle shots where it's like the movie just like stops to go. Look how cool this is. Look how awesome this is. It's Look hype. how epic this is. This is so epic. And so all the people who watch it go home and like they want they, they're they're imagining the whole audience going home and using the word epic to describe it to their friends and family. And this movie is is suffering in retrospect from all the movies that came after, because the longer it goes, the more obvious it is, the more you catch on to what they're doing and how they do it. And you can go back to this movie and see it in action. It's like, oh, now that I've caught on to it, five movies down the line, you see it in this one. Um, the big, uh, the, the, the big team shot would all stand in there and yeah, that, that. The, fa- the famous 180 shot of them all standing like back to back, uh, the, this, how many gifts that like obnoxious blue checkmark liberals on Twitter use this movie has probably produced the most gifts that they use. Oh, oh yeah. Like, there's, it's... there's the one of like t- Robert Downey Jr. Like rolling his eyes. Uh, there's there's the one where uh, Steve goes. I I understood that reference, which I do think is cute because that's, I was talking about the flying monkeys. Oh yeah, no, that's not a. That's he saw that's that not, opening that's day. Not a bad line. To think. Yeah, I I think Steve really likes the. Wizard I mean, Wizard of Oz was the Avengers of its time. It it was Judy Judy Garland was just like Scarlett Johansson. Um, Hulk was Hulk would have been the the. Cowardly Lion? I no, I mean, know. I'm serious. Like, uh, it was a huge hit. It, it, it kind of oh, yeah. was like the oh, first absolutely. big color movie. And well, all that, that, like, stuff. Gone with the Wind. but uh, Well, Gone with the Wind was like... Wizard of Oz has the benefit of not being racist. Gone with the Wind was like a historical epic, though, which is like a different... Gone with the Wind was like, yeah. what's the what's the last one of those we had? Like, big prestige, middle-brow drama Oscar sweeper movies. Um, I, I got to look... I. Totally drawing a blank. I could probably answer that question when we weren't talking about Marvel movies because I'm 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 trying to keep my brain on on well, this. Eventually, we'll get to thank, Eternals. Thankfully, this movie held my attention enough for me to still eventually have we'll get focus to, on uh, this. We'll get to Eternals, which is when Marvel tried to have oh. a big middle brow serious Oscar movie, which is such a so funny. Academy Award winner Chloe Zhao. Yeah, Jow, so actually. The Z-H is, is more of a J sound. Oh, okay. Uh, in, uh, sorry. Uh, in that system of transliteration. Yeah, she was born rich. She's from like right at the top yeah. of the Chinese bourgeois there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So far, uh, the only two women who have won Academy Awards, uh, one is one is her and the other is Kathleen Bigelow, a.k.a. Uh, the, the military industrial complex's favorite female filmmaker, I think. Although I, I did watch Near Dark the other day because it came onto movie. Uh, still, still really enjoyed it. Um, but let's see, what else can we. Also, also, uh, also gave yeah. us two of the more obnoxious leading men in the Marvel canon. 
Yeah. With uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Renner, Renner and... in Hurt Locker and Chris, Chris Pratt in uh, was one of the, that was one of his first. In Wait, the, was he? He's in Zero Dark Thirty. He's one of the guys who goes and kills Bin Laden. That was one of, that oh, was, that's... that was like when he first <laughs> was transitioning into being like ripped, uh, big budget movie star guy. That was his like but interstitial was, okay. move from chubby goofball on sitcom to hot action star. That was okay. Uh, that that was where he made the transition was in Zero Dark Thirty, and then okay. Oh God! So so what we're saying is it's Catherine Bigelow's fault, people. We'll have to do a Catherine. It's, it's all it's a woman's fault. I don't. I, you know, I want it's to a watch woman's fault. Near Dark and Strange Days because I've heard those are both pretty good. Um, yeah. Um, I I have a theory that the only reason Near Dark came onto movie is because uh, Red Letter Media just did like a review on it, and they spent a significant amount of time talking about how you can't find it. Like it's not like easily streaming anywhere. It's like one of those movies that's that like Strange Days just doesn't seem to be available anywhere on like streaming or digitally. Um, so I I think someone at movie. Is is also like me and just watches a lot of red letter media and was like, oh, let's they, just get they, the rights they, to this. So maybe been, we'll be seeing Strange Days soon. I've been like watching old movies I loved as a kid and, and rewatching them and talking about how good they are. And then like two weeks later, I'll see a review on them, like Total Recall, Tremors. So I appreciate yeah. them because like both 1990 movies, actually underrated here in film, both awesome movies that are like not obscure, but are like, I think, a little underappreciated. Um but I, you know, I need to take a little bathroom break. I'll be right back. Okay, we're gonna, Miguel. We're gonna pause uh, here. We're intermission. Gonna, intermission. All right, I'm back. Okay. Did you? All right, we're back. Every. Oh my god. Um, for people, so me and me and Stu are uh, video chatting over recording, and he is holding a giant fucking gun. This is <laughs> oh, uh... what? What? <laughs> Uh, it's it's a replica. It doesn't do anything. Uh, it's a it's a replica Lamat revolver from the Civil War era. My grandfather bought it. My deceased grandfather purchased it when he visited my aunt in Maryland at the Gettysburg. No, not Gettysburg. Maybe oh maybe it was the Gettysburg battlefield like gift shop. And uh, he passed away a couple years ago. My grandma said I should take this home with me when I came back up. How, here's a gun. It's huge. It's it's huge. It's That's, it's a big fucking gun. It's, a, it's like an eight or nine shot cavalry cap and ball uh, revolver. It also has like a, 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 a sh- under barrel shotgun on it. It's 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 massive. You could, you could take out Lincoln with that. You could like you, you, you could you could kill a bear with this with this thing <laughs> if it was real. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I was just looking over my notes and then I, I, I looked up because I, I heard sound of, of, of your door and you're just, you're just like fisting a gun. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, okay. I just, I'm a fidgeter and I cannot stop fidgeting with things. I had that around me, so I couldn't stop touching it. Uh, so I, I think one thing we haven't brought up yet is, uh, cause this is, this is the movie where Joss Whedon officially came on board although he did do some uh like a, a little bit of s- script doctoring and directed like the uh final end credit scene of Captain which, America which is just Avenger. in this, this movie is, that's which is in which is just repurposed in this movie yeah. not that i mind because i i actually fucking love that scene just because i, I already talked about it on the that my old like pinup poster but just you just the, get I, I you just know. get There's something real so excited sexy. when he knocks that punching bag off the uh, off the. Thing. Well, yeah, he has him fucking lined up, so presumably he's been like knocking the stuffing out of like five other punching bags there, and he's like all sweaty and glistening. He's like a like a like a sweet honey ham <laughs> or something. Like, the, the, the camera loves Chris Evans. Um, he, yeah, he looks really great. I, in this I would movie, get canceled but... so fast if I described a woman that way. <laughs> This is sweet honey <laughs> Um, but it's something we haven't brought up yet because this is this is where Joss Whedon comes on board. So uh, this is where Joss Whedon, Whedon speak. This is where Joss Whedon comes. It's just cut to this the... is where he comes. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of Whedon speak, or at least a lot of like snappy one-liners. Most of them are belong to Tony, which, which makes sense. I, which makes sense. Like I. To- like Whedon speak and Tony Stark are kind of a, or at least Robert Downey Jr. and his charm are like a match made in heaven. Yeah. 
or or hell, like depending on who you ask. Um, because he told out of actually out of everyone in this movie, I think kind of Tony Stark has the least motivation or the least the least like reason to be involved other than like pure ego. But like he he's he's really playing like the comic relief in this movie, especially. He's he's just there to like, you know, stand around, give, you know, roll his eyes like a drama queen, give quippy one-liners, like and and you know, dialogue that, you know, you're supposed to stand up and cheer, like, I have a plan, attack, or you know, shit like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't know what you're I I you probably are better at detecting on what sort of lines are cringe and which are okay. Um, let me look at my notes here. What, what was it especially? I, because I saw your notes, you said something was an especially cringe line. I, th- I think most of them were fine. Um, like, I don't, like, I don't mind, for lack of a term, quippy, snappy dialogue. And I, that's my thing is like, what, when does, what makes it work and what makes it not work? Why has it become yeah, that's, so, yeah. so cringe? Like what, when did quip? Cause I mean, like, Whedon's whole inspiration is like not not to say he reaches that level or anything, but like is like the the screwball comedies of the '30s, '40s, you know, where people are talking fast yeah. and throwing zingers at each other. And there's nothing inherently like it's it's you know writing is a style like there's nothing inherently good or bad about naturalistic or stylized dialogue, um, especially something like a comic book movie. Um, so, so to me, the question of what makes like a good or bad quip or one liner or joke is like how tonally consistent is it with what's going on. How um, in appropriate is it for that character in their context? Like, like that, that, that kind of thing, right? Like, th- th- does it express a sentiment that fits the character in your experience? And I think that's why a lot of the time they're frustrating now is it's like in the middle of an action sequence or in the middle of an emotional beat, they drop them in to diffuse the tension so yeah. that the audience is never too sad or never too excited or never too nervous. It's 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 used yeah. to constantly keep things at a at a at a at an emotional comfortable emotional medium, and I think that's where it gets. Uh, aside from just like being not funny or it also being out of character, or whatever. That's also I think when when it becomes what what is called now soy dialogue. Um, yeah, but I think yeah, I had to know like it, um, f- yeah. Um, uh, what was the one? I think the uh, the that guy's playing Galaga thing that was improv that, that was that was a robert downey jr improv and and then Joss they Whedon shot and thought it was so good that they like green screened in a galaga game onto that guy's screen oh that makes more sense then and i guess it would be fine as a yeah. line but i felt like the insert of the guy actually playing galaga was too much it was too much uh too much cherry on top it's like the it's yeah. too it's too goofy for for what this movie is it's too much it's it's way too like like this random computer guy is is literally just playing Galaga when he's supposed to be saving the world like it's yeah um, and again it's not like um a, a plot inconsistency thing it's just tonally it it's 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 a little too out there um well there there is I I wrote down one thing that Tony says because it's like not only is it like super soy in my opinion but also it's like weird that tony's the one saying this um it's it's during sort of the where they're all like really going back and forth with each other they're snipping out each other and shit with uh loki scepter in the foreground or, or the background and and tony says an intelligence organization that fears intelligence historically not awesome yeah well I mean, that's the thing where like none of the characters relationships to shield and its power make a ton of sense because shield doesn't make a lot of sense so their like relationship to Nick Fury's authority can never make a lot of sense. Um and that's because like we talk like we've been talking about since Iron Man 1, the whole relationship of the liberal imaginary to authority can never really make a ton of sense cuz it's like, well, America is good. Sometimes it does bad things, but the bad things are like a separate thing that can be kind of solved and clipped out to preserve what is basically a good thing and America's institutions are good. And the CIA has done some bad things in the past, but they also protect us from threats and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, you know, the, the military does complex and everything. Like it can't. I mean, if, if you want to know this whole discourse, just like see what's going on in terms of like coverage of the Russian you, you think, or it's like situation. That's a lot of, a lot of uh, like what 
sort of the, the liberal war which which and i are i kind of want to address that because i talked about right right before putin invaded yeah, ukraine right we, hit record. I, I, we, we 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 recorded the yet unreleased captain america episode and i talked about how america's bad guys are always hitler and like i don't think vladimir yeah. putin is hitler that's uh that's that's another like three steps vladimir putin is vladimir putin yeah and but that's then that's the framework it's the 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 designated bad guy i mean he is a bad guy but i mean so is the president of the united states always a bad guy um Joe, Joe Biden, yeah, Joe, noted war criminal and uh, old man possibly shitting his pants right now. Mass incarcerator of of uh, poor people and 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 racial minorities. Joe Biden, um, come on, man, come on. Although it was, I I I think it was the the best part of the 2020 election cycle was when he called that guy fat. <laughs> oh, I mean, he's he's hilarious Listen, as like an old guy who can barely talk. Um, I, I I do like to Joe Biden post sometime. Like it's just getting in that mindset. You can just ramble off oh, the man. most inane shit, and and it just makes me laugh. Um, Sundowning. Yeah. There's like three episodes of the E1 podcast that are all just Joe Biden. All the Joe Biden yeah, episodes are really, really so funny. good. Um, Joe Biden. But um, it, and it's the same thing where it's like it's the superhero narrative. Oh, Vladimir Putin's Loki or or whoever. He's this bad guy who's so bad that anything can be justified to stop him. Um, and whoever's fighting him is a good guy by comparison. And 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 it's the bad guy has to be fought. There's there's no there's never any sense that like, oh, we could make things worse. There's there's no larger nuance. It's just there's a bad there's a bad guy picking on a little guy. We need to fight the bad guy and stand up for this these abstract principles of freedom or whatever. And the real consequences damn them the whole countries are just yeah. reduced to their leader and their leader is just a figure in a comic book narrative and that's i just I'm, I'm constantly insanely frustrated by it but it's also that's the worldview that uh capital and state have created to make their foreign policy manageable because if people had any real sense of what's going on they would not support any of this shit right um and and like um also, like uh, as as I mentioned in my uh, like totally ripping off half in the bag uh, uh, intro summary of this movie, uh, Shield is like a plot point is that Shield is secretly developing their own, and they literally use the term weapons of mass destruction. They're from using the Tesseract's energy, but then that kind of that whole pl plot points kind of like dropped as soon as the actual like loki and alien invasion starts because it's, by by virtue of that happening it's like justified yeah it's it's just there long enough to create the conflict that allows loki to get out of prison and drives everybody apart for 10 minutes until they all come back together yeah that's that's all it's really there for it's just there to make to make Steve sus. Yeah, it's just there to make all the characters argue. And then it's kind of shoved off screen. Because again, like all this stuff, it's it's gestured at to create a little bit of plot or tension. But the real ramifications of it can never be explored because it's too fucking hot to handle. And, and it raises too well, many troubling yeah. questions for the worldview of the whole thing. Um, well, and according to Nick, well, the. And I, I did always find this actually funny. Um, cons considering Thor movie is so bad, but I, I, Nick Fury is spe like specifically says the reason we are developing these weapons is because of Thor, because of his appearance on our planet that got us to thinking like, you know, we are clearly not alone, you know, okay, Thor was a good guy, but we can't say the same for like the next alien invaders. And I'm, I'm not even... Let's let's pretend because at, at this point there was no Captain Marvel wasn't in the cards for this. And I believe like Cap Captain Marvel takes place in like the fucking 90s. Like they got a de-aged Samuel L. Jackson. I, I, Samuel I L. haven't Jackson. seen so it. We'll, ignoring we'll that, get to it. I, that's going to suck. <laughs> we, we, but, we can talk uh, about we can talk about the canon as it exists in the movies up to this point, because whatever comes later yeah. is a retcon and the contradiction is on them. So who fucking cares? Right. So. So, like, as because you you also as in your notes are like, what is Nick Fury's motivation for wanting to get this in Avengers initiative off the ground? And it's 
I guess we're just led to believe it's because it's because he believes in heroes yeah that's like the, the, thing. the him, scene what you're what exactly you're talking about like he just wants to put together his own fucking accent him and colson believe in heroes and the importance of heroes I- I- exceptional individuals who rise above the generic masses and 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 make or unmake or in this case protect the world and don't change it tony stark is almost on the verge of changing their world but we'll never see that really manifest um uh, it'll always just be a thing happening in the background because these always have to take. Less, that's, that's, that's one of those. I guess that's what's interesting about Watchmen as like a little aside is the the comic. It takes yeah. the the ramifications of the heroes seriously on the world they live in, and they live in a different world from ours because of that. Like the technology is different because of Doctor Manhattan and all this stuff, and that's something regular comics don't really do. All all this insane sci fi stuff happens, but somehow never trickles down to the real world. It doesn't change the cars or the environmental problems or anything else. It's that's always been weird to me, even as a kid. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? Speaking of Coulson, because I I do really want to. This is the big problem, at least for me, or the big the big cinema sin of this movie Ping. is is that it, it kills. They kill off Agent Coulson, and then it's it's confusing as to like what. That, like because he's later revived, I'm still not sure what the fuck I happened. Feel like he the, was literally revived just to be on Agents the, of Shield. I think the movie so they, like, is hinting at retconned his death. Well, I mean, uh, to be a fake out, but it also just like okay, so was Nick Fury just like Nick? I'm I'm just picturing Nick Fury like grabbing the Captain America fanboy cards out of. Colson, like out of Colson's locker, and then just like swiping it through his blood, like, yeah, yeah, he, he blood got on the all. floor. But like, I felt like the movie was implying they might have exaggerated Colson's demise for the sake wait, of which I, th- I think there's an uh, it's it's plausible. I, I, mean, I, I, can, I remember getting that also, feeling when I saw the movie before the show came out and confirmed it. I kind of had that feeling, but uh, I mean, on this rewatch, it really felt like like. Joss Whedon intended Coulson to actually die that like Coulson died. And what is, what was fake was that he did not have the, you know, Captain America trading cards in his, in his jacket, like the, the bloody card things. That was just like a, like a visual ploy to really pull at the Avengers, like sentimentality to get them into action. But here's, here's my impression was at the time, like Joss Whedon intended for Colson to I, die, I, and then Kevin Feige was like, "We're good. We're doing a TV show now." I, I we think. Need a guy. I mean, his brother headed up the show. Oh, okay. so it was all part of a package deal, right? Like, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I think it was that thing might have actually been planned, but um, what does it's get me so is how weird it is that like there's this random guy who's just sort of been a, a G man, a, 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 a G man who annoys Tony Stark for two movies. A suit he is, is like him dying is what brings the gang back together to be like, this is what we're fighting for. Yeah. Uh, he's basically like an entirely new character. In this oh movie. yeah. They, well, that's what they, like, they as, give him. As the, soon as he runs, as soon as he runs into Steve Rogers, he, be, he he's, becomes he's, just he like, he suddenly me. goes from being one dimensional to two dimensional. <laughs> As soon as he meets the, the second America. dimension being that he's horny for Steve Rogers, which can't blame him. But like that's it's you know we we had none of he was you know in Iron Man one and all the rest of his movies he just shows up to be like uh, fucking you know Mister Anderson yeah kind of shit like he he just he feels just like a suit he's just a, a no fun suit and like now we give him this extra dimension which. Is also like he's also there as like this development of his character is part and parcel to the very end of this movie, which is that like newsreel compilation of people like getting Captain America tattoos and like spray painting Tony Stark murals on the sides of bodegas. Yeah, and yeah. The, the but, Avengers like, the, the fandom a, aspect. Yeah, they have a fandom in universe. And 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 that is something I actually do really like i mentioned this on our captain america episode like that his characters they allowed his character to kind of 
be meta in that aspect. Like he is, when they say he's the world's first superhero, they mean it both in like the sense of the like super soldier serum um, being successful with him, but also in the sense that he developed and had his own like a uh, public image as a hero. like people were making comic yeah. books. He had like little serials well, that he was doing before he was deployed into Europe and, uh, you know, kicked ass and uh, threw Bucky off the train. He didn't throw Bucky off the train before he, he'll, he'll come back. People Bucky's coming back. Don't worry. Yeah. They, they, lean, uh, but- they lean more and more to that soft meta element where it's like superheroes exist in the world, but they also exist as a concept and as brands the way they do in real life. Um, yeah. But, which, but they don't I do mean, a, I, enough I, with it to make it interesting. It feels more just like a, a self suck. Like, like it's a way to point, look, 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 the, the, the people of New York in the movie are so in love with the Avengers and so excited that they saved their lives. The Avengers are this important to you in real life because they saved your life psychically and emotionally by giving you a, 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 a this, this important catharsis in, in your need for the belief in heroes and and the exceptional greatness of America and and, and American liberalism as it's extended globally around the world and so on. Um, Although I, I will say, sir, revisiting this movie, it felt kind of quaint that the gimmick of this movie is we are bringing together all these different characters from different movies into one movie because that is what like media in our movies are now like that, that the whole, you know, uh, cinematic universe thing. Well, of now pulling, it's a metaphor. You know, oh, we got this person back. Like, Oh, you, like, like the, I haven't seen the new, the, the Halloween kills movie. I don't care to, because I hear it's awful, yeah. but like they made a big deal of like, Oh, we brought back, you know, this person and this person. And like, like that sort of, like, it feels quaint by comparison especially because it does manage to give everyone or every character a thing to do like it is a relatively speaking a pretty well structured yeah it is like in terms of the type of movie it is like like yeah um evaluating it it on what it's trying to do it's it's it doesn't feel it doesn't feel overstuffed like many of these sorts of movies now do um and I, I do think that has a lot to do with just Joss Whedon being the right guy for the job. Unfortunately, that didn't translate into the second movie. We'll, but we'll get we'll, to, we'll get to uh, yeah. Age of Ultron when we get to that. Um, oh, one thing. We got to bring up uh, the best scene in the movie. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton oh, yes, appears, yes. everybody. Harry Dean Stanton, uh, rest in fucking peace, God, Harry Dean Stanton, the great Harry Dean Stanton of of the screen. Uh, God bless him for for getting getting that bag. Uh, you'll you'll probably recognize him from uh, Wim Wenders' Paris, Texas. Uh, he's I forget his character's name, but uh, he uh, in Twin Peaks, Firewalk with Me, and uh, The Return, he is the owner of the uh, Trout Trailer Park, um, and I think Trin. Twin Peaks: The Return might have been like the last thing he it might have, did. Before I think it was. Died. Yeah, like I think he it died. It was the last thing a lot of people as it was did airing. before they died. Same as uh, Miguel Ferrer. Miguel, uh, oh, our RIP. special guest Which star from Miguel the Miguel is going to show episode. up in Iron Man three. He's going to he's he's in Iron Man three, so that's silly something to look forward to. But yeah, uh, Harry Dean Stanton after uh, the Hulk is thrown from the helicarrier. Uh, crash land somewhere into some like decrepit building. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton shows up uh, just as Mark Ruffalo is waking into consciousness and he's just, uh, he's just standing there. I was like, Oh my God, it's Harry Dean Stanton. Um, And gives Bruce Banner some pants, some pants he was just carrying around. Be like, uh, you know, old, it's not every, are you a space alien? You just fell out of the sky. And it's, I, I I I loved seeing Harry D. Stan. I and I at the time I had originally seen this, I hadn't really gotten to Quinn Peaks quite yet, so I wouldn't have recognized. Well, I, him. So it was a, I, it was a delightful I surprise him to see from, him here from Alien and Repo Man. And, yeah, and he's an alien. I like yes. that you pulled out like a, a, a is it Wim Wenders or Vim Wenders? Because I know the Germans, the W's are often V's. Uh, 
Yeah, well, let's let's just say that that could be my mispronunciation. I honestly don't know for I was this episode curious. because so so far I've <laughs> done pretty well, and I'm not slurring my words like a drunk person. Well, that that one's going um, in the compilation. Um, but I just think it's funny you you pull out like one of those like German directors, and it's like he was an alien. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I don't know. I well, that's maybe it's. I I was thinking that because that's like a movie he actually was like the star main. Oh yeah, that's true. He's usually not, and as opposed to like a a side care, like a memorable side character, um, as in Alien or it, he's Gates. definitely a standout in Repo Man. He's awesome in that. That's right. He's in Repo. He's in. He's in like everything that's good. Every everything, even even this, like for the. Not even one minute he has of screen time in this movie. He he excels. Just he's he just stands there and he's like an old guy. Yeah, just carrying a, a geriatric security guard for a factory that's been abandoned since 1983. Uh, yeah, I I really like that scene. I un, unironically, I think that's the best. Oh scene no, in it's the movie. it's good. And I mean, like I said, like it's like we're 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 we're. Uh, it, it suffers in retrospect from what it spawned and what the whole MCU became and was becoming as it was made. And it, it suffers from changes and trends. And it's like, I mean, it's not like an amazing, like, you know, it's not like if, if we're going to talk about like an ideal, like spectacle action movie, yeah. Like Fury Road, uh, which came out a couple of years later, right. but it's, it is a perfectly competent, enjoyable film. And it's, if it wasn't, we wouldn't have the MCU. Maybe it's kind of a tragedy that right. it is. Uh, honestly, maybe we should be rooting for that parallel universe where it maybe. was like Justice League and it was a total mess and it imploded and we were catapulted into a, an alternate cultural trajectory that might have saved us a lot of uh, uh, tragedy. I don't know. Speaking of tragedy, uh, let's talk about the climax, because as I as I said, like. 10 years, 10, 11 years after 9-11, it finally became acceptable to destroy New York all over again. As, as long as it's um, actually Chicago, yeah. As long as, yes, I think so. This this movie, it was filmed both in like, I think, well, I think it was Cleveland, actually. Cleveland, what? Cleveland, Ohio, yeah. I, I read somewhere that they originally were going to shoot in Michigan, and then like Michigan got rid of their like film tax incentive so the production was like yeah we're fucking going to cleveland they're giving us a tax break yeah you're right so i went in albuquerque new york and los angeles um i thought it was chicago for some reason maybe that was a later one or a different i i i feel i don't know i don't know or no i think you you might be thinking of the dark night maybe uh, yeah dark night was definitely chicago um that was chicago uh, miguel can can Um, we get Um, and, and after that, uh, Miguel, can you can you cut in? I found a place where everyone will know my happy mustache face. This is the Cleveland show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Why? <laughs> I just, just want to make people listen to my name is Cleveland Brown. Um, but yeah, the climax of this movie, we were uh, just like 9-11, but worse committed by space alien terrorists um i and as i am ought to do i like to sometimes revisit some of my favorite film essays so for this one i was like what a great time to revisit the imagination of disaster by my girl susan sontag um so that like probably her most well-known essay um besides like notes on camp but at the very end of the essay um i'm gonna par not paraphrase a bit but sort of abridge certain lines, but uh, the end of this essay feels really prescient or applies very when, much to- uh, When was this written? Not just the climax. Um, Hold on. When was, let me, can you, I, I should probably not be holding my book really close to my microphone. Uh, uh, no, okay, 1966. So this is- Oh, this is before the- 65, no, this is 65. So this is so before she was writing this the in 1965. 70s disaster movie wave or the 90s disaster movie wave. This is, she's, so at the time she was reflecting mostly on like, you know, schlocky bit 50s, like, b moot like the shit, like the day the earth stood still, uh, okay, like yeah. the worlds, like that shit. Um, even like there was, I had used this- essay when i was i uh, wrote a paper about like the original godzilla 
Um, cause she, she also gives a lot of reference to like Japanese movies and like the, the trauma about nuclear war and nuclear annihilation. Um, but the end of this, um, <clears throat> she says, what I am suggesting is that the imaginary, the imagery of disaster in science fiction is above all the emblem of an inadequate response. The interest of the films, aside from their considerable amount of cinematic charm, consists in this intersection between a naive and largely debased commercial art product and the most profound dilemmas of the contemporary situation. Ours is indeed an age of extremity, for we live under continual threat of two equally fearful but seemingly opposed destinies, unremitting banality and inconceivable terror. It is fantasy served out in large rations by the popular arts, which allows most people to cope with these twin specters. For one job the fantasy can do is to lift us out of the unbearably humdrum and to distract us from terrors, real or anticipated, by an escape into exotic, dangerous situations, which have last minute happy endings. But another of the things that fantasy can do is normalize what is psychologically unbearable, thereby inuring us to it. In one case, fantasy beautifies the world, and the other, it natu naturalizes it. And then she concludes, the fantasy in science fiction films does both jobs. Uh, if it, the films reflect worldwide anxieties and they serve to allay them. Um, so yeah, the, especially the line like uh, about uh, normalizing the psychologically unbearable, like if like 9-11 was like the great American trauma that opened the 21st century, yeah. like people still like, you know, you, you'll people still talk with such like a reverence or not a reverence, but just like a, like a seriousness about it, which, you know, understandable, but like for all the, for all the 9-11 jokes we've made on this podcast, but like it, it was the big national trauma. Um, and a lot of, for, for like a while in movies, like you couldn't show anything that even just slightly maybe brought up like an inkling of the image of the towers falling in New York. Like the, there's like Spider-Man had to exercise like the yeah. Spider-Man. I think they had to cut a scene of, of him like swinging from the twin towers, but even like, even just certain shit, like, uh, like certain song lines that reference like airplanes were like completely censored, uh, in the years after nine 11, because it was just, it was too raw or too real. And um, it's just and it's just very interesting to me, especially that and then like it it took just until like 2012 for us and probably not even until 2012. I'm sure there were a bunch of other movies where they were still like destroying uh, the, the, the Spielberg like, War of the Worlds comes to mind as a, a like I think that's yeah, like that's five right. and that's like an early like but it, it, it avoids it has the airplane thing, but it avoids like the big like big towers coming down. It avoids the kind of like mass urban destruction that this movie indulges in. But it. Um, yeah, but it definitely would like aesthetically channeling 9-11, like the the heat rays from the from the it happens. It starts off in on Long Island, I think, or in New York or maybe New Jersey, but like that region. And it, it kicks off with like the big tri tripods coming out the ground and their heat rays yeah. evaporate people and turn them to dust. And everything's covered in dust, just like it was after the towers came down. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's very. The, the aesthetic impact of 9-11 alone, much less the theme, although there can't be neatly disentangled, is like, it's it's remarkable. It's also weird because it kind of uh, oscillated between we can't show this and then it's everything has to look like news footage of 9-11 looked when it came to uh, kind of action spectacle or, 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 or sort of catastrophic drama. Um, it was, I, I don't know, like, I can remember the first couple of years after that, it was still... Action movies and stuff were were still like pretty cheesy and felt like an extension of what they were doing in the late nineties, like like cheesy Matrix slow mo, very goofy, like chart like the, those uh, like Charlie's Angels movies with um, yeah Drew Barrymore, yeah and, Mick G, yeah yeah. Um, so so we're still getting a lot of that, but yeah, as as it goes on, you start like the Bourne movies are very like like the gritty realistic thing kind of it, it like. There was like a lag time, but then by like 2004, it really kind of, or five, it kind of yeah. really kicked in. And I mean, like, I, I wrote in my notes that like, you know, th these are like, I, I wrote literally space terrorists are okay, 
like in the sense like they're it's okay to have like a billion of them show up wreak havoc and then get like nuked they get the nuked that's they're not act they're completely alien that's others. the thing like like, not- like i mean the, the nuke is launched by like terrified world leaders doing something they're not supposed to but but, Off the shield but Hel- Hel- iron Harry. man steers it into the big glow hole like in uh like in battlefield earth actually uh like in independence day yeah no but in battlefield earth they send a nuke through the wormhole and blow oh up the God. alien home planet if i remember correctly this, um this shouldn't uh, i'm sorry but sidebar this we shouldn't have this shouldn't be the second time we're referencing battlefield earth in reference to a marvel movie i mean like as like uh, any movie you shouldn't have to bring up like M- battlefield earth in comparison more than once battlefield, or, battlefield or once earth has matter. a lot in common with marvel movies um yeah, I'm gonna have to. We we maybe we'll have to. It's do just a instead of fanboys of comics, it was fanboys of L. Ron Hubbard who made it. Um, uh, yeah, fanboys of of Scientology and uh, what's the what's the monster? What's the thing they worship? Uh, well, they don't worship. No, Zenu is like the, a more of a Zenu. Zenu is more of a demiurgical figure, a satanic okay, whatever. figure. I think. Um, it's it's not real. It's just it's Scientology is just like these Marvel movies. It's not real people. Um. I just, I'll just, yeah, I'll just put my fedora I, on and say, that's true of all religion. <laughs> that's true of all religions. Uh, I, and the other, other thing I can like guess at is, is also like, we don't see any civilian casualties. No, never. Either in this movie. Um, although it is, there is, uh, I think Black Widow says that Loki has killed 80 people. Which is more than like most serial killers. But I think that was like uh, like that's a, that's like I think a that side was mostly line. Mostly the people in the shield that. base, um, or maybe so, uh, so. But but by that metric, Loki is we we can call Loki a serial. Oh killer. sure, yeah, or more of a mass <laughs> or, or, murderer. He's a, he's he's really murderer. kind of a um a uh uh, uh gay or Hannibal Lecter. No, no, um, he, that's his dad. His his adopted dad. <sighs> Fuck my me. my brain for drawing a blank on this on this name. I I should know. He he's more of a he, he's more of like a an emo Stephen Paddock. Oh god. <laughs> oh god. Okay. All right. Um. Yeah. He's just. All the, another thing is just like I have to think, especially. Because we both agree that the Thor movie is terrible, yeah, oh, and awful. that it sucks, and so it it almost on on one hand I feel like did they feel that like making Loki the antagonist this movie might have been a bit of a risk, um, but I I don't know I, if anything I think Loki might have been like the standout character in that he first was Thor oh movie. he totally so was maybe that yeah um, so that that's probably the rationale but I I. He's a, I, I see the appeal of the Loki character. Like, he's very fun in concept, like, of, of the trickster. It's very similar to, like, the Joker. Yeah, yeah. In a way, but, like, Loki is Joker for, like, ace girls and, yeah. like, people who form polycules. Yeah, you know, that, I mean, the Joker's also for people who form <laughs> polycules. I found, I, but there's a different, different types of, different, different, different uh chemical compositions to those polycules i think between but, the joker yeah, polycule and the loki polycule um but they 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 feel like comparable yeah to they, me, or at least in sort of the sort of like one of at least one of the sort of essences that makes the the, the anti-hero DNA. or bad guy that certain people resonate with because they feel alienated it's like yeah i'm also a dark brilliant figure who doesn't fit in and is overshadowed by jocks jocks like thor and batman who 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 are captain of the football team and get all the girls um but yeah he is yeah i mean and i mean you know like tom hiddleston's good like again like the casting we're just gonna keep going back the casting is that's, really that's holding their, this whole thing together strongest suit. and that's probably that's, why they spend the so much money on like uh robert downey robert jr downey and jr. stuff is like like huge did i i said 50 million 50 million dollars everyone else got like two to five yeah. like single digits um so that's that's cute uh speaking of money and i think this is sort of 
uh, this this comes at the very end of the movie, so we can maybe move, we can move on if we want after this, but to like watch something else or other recommendations. But um, because I after you really brought up the sort of key your key thesis of this movie, really selling superheroes as both a concept and as a Marvel property, I notice there's there's one shot in that climax um like iron man like falls to the ground and in the background it's the farmer's insurance building oh yeah it's like right huge in the background and i just like i saw that and i wrote (laughs) we wrote sponsored by farmer's insurance and then of course there's next to i think it's next to that farmer's building there there's the shawarma place which this movie also has the distinction of making shawarma like immensely popular for a couple of months into 2012. Yeah. Which, which is funny because Until people um, found out it's just another I, name for a donair or a, or a falafel basically, or a variation. Yeah. But so, uh, other fun facts that I know about, uh, so that, that ending like end credits scene where it's just like the, the goofy shot of all the Avengers eating shawarma and the totally decrepit, like, broken down shawarma place uh that i don't think it it was not filmed as part of the original cut of the movie it was actually filmed like the day before the movie premiered and um so yeah I'm yeah it was added in technical. really Cause this late because they because it was they, like it i was, think test audiences added, thought the line was funny but yeah um but uh and i i because I mentioned Snowpiercer on our last episode, um, because I suspect, suspected like was Snowpiercer in development around the same time as Captain America. So Chris Evans is uh, Captain America in that scene. He's like turned away from the camera and he has his like face on his chin um, because at the time Chris Evans was like just about to start shooting or was in the middle of shooting Snowpiercer. And for that movie, he you know grew out his his beautiful beard I uh, got like a buzz cut. So he completely did not look like Steve Rogers. So they gave him like a prosthetic chin um, that looked like shit. And he was like, we can't film this. So just like, have, just film me sort of away from the camera, like holding up my face um, and a wig. So that's, yeah. So that's, that's why you don't see Chris Evans' beautiful face in, in that uh, uh. ending scene. But it is him. It is him wearing a uh, comically prosthetic chin that we also can't see to go with his but, prosthetic yeah, feet Shorma and and the prosthetic feet from the uh from the uh, and, captain uh, america uh, and, behind the scenes of the movie there's also and uncle okay, jack's one, hands one last from thing. it's always sunny in philadelphia <laughs> one last thing i will i this is this is this is my uh nicole nicole loves chris evans corner uh thing of of the episode uh other other cute kind of behind the scenes picture to look up there's a picture of like chris evans he's like pushing a push broom to like help clean up the set like the new york uh destroyed like new york set it's really cute (laughs) it's really cute i'm sorry it's he's helping um which is like theoretically what probably like captain america was doing after uh new york like just just sweeping up debris that's kind of all he can do like he's he's strong and shit and he can he can do stuff but like it's not like he can put buildings back together like what or lift shit like iron man or whatever he's he's just like helping clean up which is cute but um let's let's talk about something else um yeah other than marvel i think we've i think we've we've done a very good job of uh knocking the shit out of this movie we've I we've think, done unless an awesome there's anything job. i oh wait the one oh. thing one thing i do want to bring up one thing I I will kick myself if I don't if I didn't bring this up because I I was looking through the IMD trivia page and I learned that the um the CGI like the Hulk CGI body like that that body was 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 modeled after a Long Island stripper <laughs> like a Long Island male stripper dead ass. What do you think that guy must look like I, in real life? He's he also happens to be big and green. Funny enough, that's amazing. He has he, he's very sick. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah that and um oh apparently uh the film like Whedon and Co they wanted to put Oscorp Tower 
in like the scenery of New York and they just didn't get the rights from Columbia in time. So theoretically, that would have been like the first potential crossover between like rainy Spider-Man and the MCU. So uh, Uh. yeah, take that, John Watts, Uh, whatever. But let's yeah. What's something you would recommend people to watch uh, if, if they don't like stupid superhero movies, well, I'm, I'm gonna say even if they're kind of fun. if you want to see what like a schlocky like like what i think is like the ideal of like a schlocky stupid summertime hollywood blockbuster where a city blows up independence day it rules in precisely all the ways that it's extremely stupid um <laughs> welcome to earth yeah 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 no but, but, but it's like it's <laughs> it's well paced it's entertaining the effects are all great because it's like Mostly practical stuff, miniatures, uh, 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 models, that kind of thing, uh, uh, suits. Looks pretty good. Like, this is like, Independence Day is like the ideal of what this type of movie is. Um, and what it's this movie is Jeff definitely Goldblum. removed. I got Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith. Keep my name out your fucking mouth! Randy Quaid, uh, um, Bill, uh, I, I know Bill Pullman. I know you're thinking of. Yes. Like, uh, I mean, I, Lu- I think Lucas Haas, member of the Pussy Posse, Lucas Haas. Isn't it? He may very well I be. I, I wouldn't know him from Adam. Um, but I, I mean, admittedly, like, I grew up watching that movie on VHS tape when I was a wee lad. So, so I'm very warm towards it in a way I probably wouldn't be. But also, like, the fact that it's all practical stuff makes it hold up in a way like later Emmerich movies, even like 2012 and Day of the Earth, still don't. Because um, they have that same, like, everything's on a green screen problem. Um, yeah, like real, real old fashioned sp- spectacle. Um, and then if you want to watch like like a legitimately great movie, um, speaking of Harry Dean Stanton, uh, Repo Man. The Repo Man is very Repo good. Man rules. Um, also, yeah, uh, also co starring Emilio Estevez, uh, who I don't think people realize he's the brother of Charlie Sheen. They don't. They, I thought they everybody took different knew last that. names. Yeah, I, I I mentioned it to someone. They were like, what? Uh, yeah, no, that is, that is a very good movie. Also, it's also in the, and I should probably get a copy of that. Oh, it's this, the 50% off sale, but I, I gotta resist. No, don't, um, I don't need, bleep I, that I, out. I shouldn't be consuming. Miguel, bleep that out. We're I, not getting any sponsorship money from that. So bleep <laughs> yeah, that bleep out. that out. Uh, um, uh, my recommendation, although I, I, I still quite enjoyed this movie, if, if only because Chris Evans looks completely beautiful in it. Um, and also, oh, uh, also before I give my recommendation, I should point out like the, this, the end, the first end credit, or I think, yeah, the first like end credit scene of this movie actually introduces Thanos. Oh, yeah. as, like the one who gave, who gave like Loki the Chaturi alien army. Uh, not played by Josh Brolin. If you, Thanos looks considerably more CG and uh, very unpolished and very, if not unfinished, um, in this movie. So that's that's not Josh Brolin, but that is Thanos. Um, but my recommendation, uh, for if if you're really looking for something that is like nonstop action nonstop like excitement everyone stood up and cheered like big colorful spectacle then i have to go with promare oh Um, i still need to see that you oh my god i that is a movie i saw like twice in the theaters when it came out like the first time i i saw it like i had i had only maybe seen a trailer i didn't really know what it was um so you can imagine my fucking delight when uh, I don't want to spoil anything, or, but it's let's just say it's 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 gay, it's 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 wonderfully gay, um, not not quite not in like an outright like no one says like I'm gay, but uh, they they the climax is is wonderfully gay, uh, two characters smooch, which is which is lovely, but uh, Promare is Promare is great in the like aspect it is it is very colorful there is not a moment that doesn't feel like it is contributing towards like the plot like it is super engaging the characters are all really fucking fun and i love them the music is 
fucking incredible. Um, it's, it's an anime, so you're getting all this wonderful, um, beautiful animation from stu- it's Studio Trigger's, like, first, and I think still their only release feature film, um, uh, from the director of uh, both Gurun Lagan and Panty and Stalking. So you're getting good and shit kill a kill. here in Kill a- and Kill the Kill. Maybe people um, will decide I'm a freak pervert for that, but I I, I really love Kill the Kill um, as well as Panty. That's, and that's not a that's not a hot take. Kill the Kill is a, a good good series. I mean, Studio Studio Trigger just does a lot of really great stuff um, in this movie uh, in Promare, especially with melding uh, 2D animation with. 3D animation, like it looks very seamless. Like even before, uh, like the last Evangelion movie came out, which did it very well. Like Promare did it first. Like being able to really meld those two things together in a way that looked natural and didn't make me want to shut my eyes and roll them into the back of my head. Um, but Promare is also great because it it has it's unintentionally very timely in its politics um like the bad guys the bad guys are are literally ice like american ice like the the buffoons who uh try to take undocumented people off the street like literally um well literally in the sense of like it's it's a very clear feels like a very clear allegory although the filmmakers claim they're like we weren't trying to be political. Shit just kind of naturally got in there, which is kind of the best way to do a movie, like a movie that sort of naturally uh, has those things or, or touches yeah, upon you, certain you, you let- topics without like specifically or intentionally trying to point at that, like a something that really like a zeitgeist down sort of movie. Into the work instead of setting out like, I'm going to make a political thesis in the form of an anime movie, which. Uh- yeah. Well, P- Promare is like the best kind of, um, I think, I'll have to quote uh, Rocky uh, Viper Waves review. I think Rocky had said like, it, it's it's like being back in like 2010 and you're beating up a Lucky Star fan. <laughs> like something something like that, which is, which very much captures the energy of this movie. Like I, it, it was, seeing that in theaters was like probably one of my best theater experiences it was like crowd pleaser is the best way i can like describe this like every time every time i put it on for like my friends i a couple months ago put it on for my roommate because we went and saw bell and uh they were kind of let down by it i was okay with the movie but then i was like let's let's watch promare because that's a perfect movie and it was just like I, i i turned turned over to look at my roommate and just like awe awe on their face so I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, watching Promare. And this, I, I mean this especially for you, dude. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't Promare seen is, it yet. Promare it's been on my list that is, that is, that is, it's on HBO Max, although I don't we know don't if get it's that in on HBO Max in um Canada. We don't get HBO Max in, in Canada. In America. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but dude, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mail actually, you my Blu-ray I, I, don't, of, I don't actually of Promare. know how to use uh I'll put this in, in, in triple parentheses. I know how to legally acquire things. Don't worry. I'll figure out a way to watch it if I want to watch it. It can be done. Um, I also, the, I'll, I'll say like I, I saw the like original Japanese dub in theaters the first time. And then I saw the English dub. I think the English dub is very good. I really like the the uh, uh, the the two protagonists are the English voice for Josuke uh, from Jojo and um, Johnny Young Bosch. Uh, so so it's 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 Kaneda from Akira. Oh, it, it, like yeah, the 80s I, Kaneda, the original. No, oh. no, no, Johnny Johnny Umbash. I, I don't know the, the, the one that doesn't the not the uh, the what is it? I think it's the Pioneer. Yeah, I think the Pioneer dub was the one that like the the first one was the streamlined dub. I think that was that was it. So I think it's the yeah it's the Pioneer dub because that's the DVD I have. Um, but yeah. Uh, if you have the ability, actually, just go if if you can and you're on the fence, just go watch Premiere right now, people. After you stop listening to this podcast, go go watch some gay shit. Go watch some gay shit. Um, go watch I think some gay we shit. Maybe I'm just being speculative here. Uh, for for our next watch something else, I feel like the things that keep coming up. It's like we need to like do some anime at some point. 
for our next like a bonus episode. Yeah. And at, we because we every we, every episode we talk about David Lynch or something David Lynch adjacent. We've got to do that at some point. Like, yeah. Oh, my God. I you will, even mentioned I will, the Cleveland show, which that, has, David, be a three has David hour Lynch conversation in it. Yeah, well, yeah, it'll be a- We'll have to we'll have to narrow. We might have to break it into two 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 episodes or something. Bad. It'll or yeah, like part one and part two, or or even like um, thinking about sort of similar filmmakers or or filmmakers who've probably had some sort of a a big impact on like genre film in general. Like I can see us probably doing a watch something else retrospective on like uh, James Cameron yeah. or you know John Carpenter literally just the same or, or even like Sam Raimi thing. yeah um, yeah we could because we could do Dark I, Man I, which is like the proto uh, I would like to see Dark Man I have not seen Dark Man or, or even well at some point we will we'll have to delve into like those awkward 90s superhero movies like the awkward teen years like Bat- Batman nipples, all that. Yeah, like yeah, like the, Spawn, all that. That, that, that shit first was... run of Batman movies, um, which I think are all uh, interesting. Um, they're definitely like, they're like even like the Joel Schumacher ones, which aren't good. Even the people that want to defend them is like camp classics. They're they're they they would be right if like half those movies was cut out. But um, they're interesting because they're very much types of movies that they never make now. Like you you know ne- you'll never see a Batman movie like. Batman Forever, or Batman and Robin, or, or even Batman Returns. No, Batman because because all ever every Batman movie now has to be like, or is at least now treated like the best movie ever made. Yeah, it's, like, it's I, Batman is like a prestige. The, the, the thing Batman's now, out right since now. The Dark Knight. It's it's like number seventy eight on the Letterbox to top two fifty now. What the fuck? It has a four point three out of five. I I have not seen this movie, but I guarantee it is not that good. I, I guarantee it. People. I mean, The Dark it's, Knight it's wasn't n- that, that good, good, but I doubt this was as good as The Dark Knight even. Oh, absolutely not. Um, um, but yeah, uh, well, yeah. The, I think The Dark Knight still ranks higher. You're right. Like, like uh, Batman but, is like a prestige property now, which is insane. It's yeah, it's, a, it's is, a man who dresses like a bat to fight crime. Um, well, it, not that there's it, anything and it does wrong have the that. distinction that more people have won an Oscar for the Joker than like any other character. Maybe I don't know. The Joker has won like two people two Oscars. So like, if you really that's want to crazy award, when you think about it, <laughs> play 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 a disabled person or play the Joker or, or be or be a, a beautiful lesser Jared or Leto. be a beautiful woman and then like put on ugly makeup to play someone fucking yeah or, or Charlie Theron yeah yeah. What if you combined all three? What if you had like, um, handicapped ugly girl Joker played by um. <laughs> Uh, fuck it, Scarlett Johansson or somebody. Oh well, f- people wouldn't see that because they'd be mad at her. Do- Although that is that is kind of her shtick, uh, playing different ethnicities. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I no, they they'd have to like no, we need a we need a, a bipoc that is actually missing her limb to be bat the Joker. I, I don't know. It's that's. I feel like that's going to happen in like 10 years, the trajectory of our culture, like hell world. Well, you know what? I was just realizing, yeah. I mean, Harley Quinn is already Joker for girls, um, formerly Joker's girlfriend. She's, yeah, she's and, Joker for girls with BPD. And um, uh, Margot Robbie's already like got two Academy Award nominations. So uh, we, we we might be on our way there. And you know I just what? need to make her disabled I... and ugly. Team, team, team! Margot Robbie should get an Oscar for Harley Quinn. Kind, I, I say that somewhat ironically, <laughs> because I, I do think she's she's really great in the role. And I, if we, when we eventually, hopefully, get to like doing Birds of Prey, um, I, I will have plenty to. I, talk I feel about like the the DC stuff is gonna have, it's gonna be more interesting in a lot of ways. Because whereas the Marvel yeah. stuff is us describing how this one thing becomes homogenous. The DC stuff is like uh, they're, they're scrambling to try and find every little bit of ground not colonized by Marvel. It's like when you play Civilization and there's like a big country's blobbed and you're like sending your guys to all little islands they haven't gotten to yet, just all over the place. Because uh, so they're like, they're like, oh, yeah. we're, we're, we're the super dark greedy, but we're also going to do this. We're also going to do Suicide Squad. We're just they're, they're just ev- they're, they're, they're just they're going all, every they're direction totally all once. over the place. Um, more. There's more of a tonal consistency or like at least a tonal coherence in like the Marvel movies. Granted, there are, there are a few that like Marvel movies like to have their angle like 
so like Captain America Winter Soldier is like a spy thriller and a little much but they're all, more serious they're compared all to like Ant Man or same, something. But they're all the same thing, just yeah. flavored a little like it's all the same basic thing. Just flavored just differently. Yeah. Um whereas the DC stuff whereas, is, yeah. is all over the map because they couldn't have no idea what they want or what they want to do or, or what's gonna sell. Um and I think that'll be interesting in a, a totally different way. Like I am um, so. I am looking forward to doing Man of S- the the Snyder stuff because that stuff is that's um, we're probably gonna do Man of Steel next. Maybe what's, what's I uh, I think I'm, I think timeline? I'm mentally ready. Um, that's the that's well that's the like next chronologically in MCU movies would be Iron Man three. But that's do we want to watch another Iron Man movie or do we want to watch Man of Steel? That's like I feel like this. It's a choice between getting they're, shot and getting. Your they're head both cut off. 2013, so I think it would be yeah. Man yeah. of Steel would be good. Then we can take a break from the Marvel stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, Man of Steel Let's, would be I think a good good one to do next. Um, they're both 2013. Yeah, as long as we're doing the same year, or we don't yeah. jump around a little bit. I think. Yeah, and also because like Iron Man three is the official start of phase two, which is they finally got the phase. Yeah. They, thing they, they, they made up the this, phase thing, is, I think after whatever. Avengers, <laughs> which, yeah. Although they, they, they snarkily like reference it in this movie. Like, Oh, these are the phase two weapons. Yeah. I was wondering okay, if that was it. intentional. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, shit. I guess we're, we're next time on marvelous. We're going to, Talk about uh, we terrible, terrible Superman. Yeah, we di- we dive into where, where things are loud. The official uh, the 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 opening salvo of the 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 DC cinematic universe, su- such as it is, because um, they that that one keeps getting retconned. Like wh- where does Joker fit in? Where does Harley Quinn fit in? Where do, where does where where does the like three different Batman's they've got all fit in? I don't know. But we're 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 gonna yeah. start with Man of Steel. Uh, Oh God! I, I, I right. one thing to look forward to with that. I think you mentioned like the lack of civilian civilian casualties in this. I've been wondering if like the oh that's the yeah that's the opposite of this movie. I think the intensive civilian flattening destruction in the Snyder movies. I wonder if that's like him like thinking that the Marvel stuff is like really pussy for not going there. And yet it's still, it's probably still going to be pussy because they got to buy by a PG thirteen yeah. rating. But it's a hard PG thirteen rating. Okay. Well, I'm I'm Nicole everybody. I'm uh I'm Stu and uh thank you so much for listening and supporting the show as always. If you could uh you know, uh leave us some positive reviews, uh just basically do our advertising for us. Uh yeah. we would be so grateful and uh that's uh that that emotional labor is an alternative form of contribution to uh monetary uh uh and 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 at the at the time we're recording this is uh uh it's march 8th uh it is uh ken the cat's birthday uh ken if you're listening to this i love you uh please 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 stop meowing at your parents it's getting annoying it's okay i love you but um it's also women's history month so if if you're listening to this in early april or whatever and you're like, shit, I didn't do anything for Women's History Month. Do it for me. Tell your friends. Put on just, a, like, do what YouTube, YouTube did and just put our podcast on their phone or whatever without asking. Do it for me. I'm uh, a, a woman. A future historical it's, woman. You need to honor me. Or send me $500. I'm not opposed to that either. Me too. Uh, I could use $500. Yeah, but it's Women's History Month. I get the five hundred dollars. Okay, on Men's History Month, you can send me five hundred. We wait till Men's History Month, <laughs> which is every other month. All right, guys. All right. Sayonara. Peace out.